always for femininity. Somebody might ask, what is femininity? Let's start from there. Let's understand the term so that in course of our discourse we will go off flow and this will be on the same page. Femininity is the nature or the quality of being a female, that's a female sex. All the attributes that make you a woman. I want you to take a look at the logos. Let's zoom in. I don't know if the computer can do that. Can you zoom in to the woman, to that image? To the image there. Can you just zoom in and let's see? Just let's look at that image. That oh, yeah. image you're looking at. Okay, if you can. Okay. Uh, that image there. If you look at it, is that an argument whether it's a woman or a man? There's no argument, right? Because there's something about it that makes you say that is a woman. Her hair, the fact that she's tying a scarf, the accessories she's wearing, the earring, the bangles, then her nails, her fingers, which she just places her fingers, then the long lashes and everything. All that make her a woman, right? So you can easily say that's a woman without having to argue, is it a man or a woman? But we know why you are need to define femininity because sometimes some people come out and you're asking is this a man or a woman today? We see them, don't we? We see people who say, mm, I don't want to be a woman anymore, I want to be a man. And all that confusion. But here, let's look at what femininity is and then let's roll. Then let's see what um, purpose and power means. Power is you have the capability, the ability, the effectiveness. You know the what what the what the, the, the let's say the control you have over something or over people or whatever it is. That purpose can mean your the aim, the intention, or whatever. So when when we say God's power, we're talking about the capability of the femininity of a woman, right? And when we say the purpose, we're talking about why or the intention of femininity. And for us to understand or dwell on this topic, there's no other place to start than from the beginning. So let's go to the Word of God. The book of Genesis, let's go to creation, because that is where we understand what purpose is. Let's go to the uh, um, book of Genesis chapter 1. We all know the um, story of creation, but I'm believing God that we look at it in a different way today. I'll read from verse 1 to 3, and it says, are you there? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form. Please follow me. Let's go to chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. If you're there, I read. And the Lord said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the grounds, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And God gave them names. Okay. Anyway, verse 21 says, And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the uh, flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made a woman and brought her unto him. And Adam said, This is now the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh, and shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Adam called Eve woman. Why? His understanding. He was taken out of me, right? And the purpose for the creation of Eve, we understand from this passage we just read, is to be a helpmate, is to be a companion, to be a helper, a partner, soulmate, if you like, the significant order. But over time, there has been an argument, what does help me to me? And we have come to take this helper, 
to become someone who is less, like a maid, like a glorified house help, like uh, someone who stays at home while the man goes to work. Even the story I had growing up was that Eve was at home and then that went to work, and that's why the serpent came to tempt Eve. So that understanding of the woman is supposed to be unseen, unheard, is of less value than the man and everything. I don't know how many of us still hold that idea or ideology that that was what God meant. There's something I want us to know today. That's all we leave this place with. I think it should be worth it. Whenever God, when God created everything he created, he turned back and said, this is good, right? I don't want to believe that if God saw a vacuum in, in Adam and said he needs help, I don't want to believe that what he needed was something less. God could have made a robot. God could have made an animal that is just a little bit more intelligent than a monkey or whatever. Or God could have cloned Adam to make two of them so that Adam would have somebody to talk to. But God made something that is higher in fashion. Why do I think so? Think of the smartphone in your hand. When you buy one and they say another has been launched, is the second one of less value? No. no. Tell me, is the second one ever of less value? No. Never. The second one comes sometimes smarter, slicker, maybe smaller in size, but the performance is, is stronger, it's faster. The speed is amazing. God did not make something of lesser in value. God made a woman stronger, smarter, more resilient, more compassionate, more beautiful, more gorgeous. For the purpose for which he created, I just that we don't understand. That's why we look at woman, we think she's weak. You may come in a smaller package. But what God endowed you with, you don't understand. Yeah. And when we don't understand the use of something, abuse becomes inevitable, right? Yeah. Park a Rolls Royce in front of a house in Ajegule. By the time you come at the following day, they're spreading melon, cassava on it, because they don't understand the value. Think that same Rolls Royce. Rolls Royce, take it to VI. Somebody will be asking, how many million is this? Can I give you 10 million? No. Can I give you 15 million? Because the person understands the value. That is why these days, when a man marries, when they bring a wife to a man, he's looking at, that's my woman. That's my mom dream woman. That person is going to clean my home. She's going to have my children. That is why the woman will remain at that level in your side. Because the Bible says, whatever the man calls her, that is what she That's is. right. If you call your woman more me than girl, that's what she remains to you. The mother of your children. Nothing more. If you call her troublemaker, no wonder they struggle in your home. You call her, look at you, busybody. What other job would she have? You call her idol, stupid, fool. No wonder your own life is not better. Because that is what she gives back to you. Because when you give a woman anything, she multiplies it. Go rest down. Shaking together, running over, she gives it back to you. Trouble is in the house. We are fighting. Why? That is what you call me. A troublemaker, right? Today, men, look at the woman sitting beside you. Call her a different name. Call her beautiful. Call her gorgeous. Call her intelligent. Call her smart. Call her success. And that is what she will be. The Bible says in Proverbs 31 that the woman did the man good all the days of her life. It's because of what he called her. It was not by magic. So if you want your woman to be a blessing, to be that helpmate that God intended, change the name you call her. Call her love and you will have abundance of it. Call her peace and peace will dwell in your home. Call her blessing and you will have abundance. Call her Grace, that is my name. And I'm so, anything God calls me Grace, my heart just, I just sings. Because that is the best name anybody can call me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. So the question is, what name are you calling your wife? And women, sometimes we don't even understand what we carry. We 
you don't understand the power and purpose of God. That is why when a man calls you anything, you stay there and say, yes, that's what I am. Every day you are crying, who told you? I just illustrated the Rolls Royce, right? If the Rolls Royce is an environment where they turn it into something for spreading, whatever, does it diminish the purpose or whatever it is? No. It doesn't. It's just in the eyes of the person looking at it. It has turned into something for spreading men on. But that same car remains what it is. So we, want, we need to understand what we are. That if you are in an environment where people don't value you, you value yourself. Because whatever you're looking for, call it respect, admiration, nobody is going to give it to you. Sometimes you take it. And you take it by proving yourself worthy. Proving yourself that you know what you can be. You know who you are made of. You know who you are. And that is when even you, you look at yourself differently. You force every other person around you to begin to look at you differently. But then we have talked about being a helpmate. A lot of times we stay there. I would say that's what God wants me to be. You hear women who say, you ask them, what do you think you're meant to do? What's your destiny? They say, well, my destiny is to support my husband, whatever he's doing, pray for him, sit at home, and take care of. It sounds really spiritual. It sounds modest. It sounds like, oh, what a wonderful woman. But you know what? That is how far you can see. That is just being short-sighted when it comes to the purpose of God for the woman. Can I tell you why? If indeed the word of God says we should be a helpmate to our husbands, which there is no argument about, how about the single women? How about women who are widowed? How about women who are divorced or separated? I'm talking about women who don't have a man in their life. Does it mean they don't have any plan in the purpose of God? So if you keep the purpose of God for women to be just a helpmate, that is just the way Adam saw it, but that's not the way God saw it. Remember that God is a designer and the creator. He knows what he created when he created women. And our purpose is beyond that. If that is where you have stayed, today I'm coming to encourage you that you need to step up. There's a lot more expected from you. Hallelujah. Amen. Can I show you? Amen. Follow me. Let's go to let's go to look. Look to, okay, anyway, before we go to Luke, let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Let us see what the Bible says there. Genesis chapter 1, let me just show to you that your work as a woman or your purpose as a woman is not only to be a helpmate. Helpmate number one assignment, yes. But there's more. And that more is here. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Okay? I continue. 27 says, okay. um, says, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. This is plural. God is saying to them and not to him. We have thought that God gave this charge to Adam. And after that, God came in chapter 2 and created Eve. Remember that things that happened at creation did not happen in chapters. They happened all in chapter 1. But chapter, in chapters was just for us to understand and to organize the Bible. But everything about creation happened once. God created Adam and saw that there was a void. He created Eve, a higher version of the human. And then he now placed both of them and said this to them, be fruitful multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the earth, and over every every living thing of, of the movement upon the earth. It's for the man, it's for the woman. So you find where it is. You're supposed to go and multiply. You find where it is. You're supposed to go and be fruitful. Fruitfulness is not only of the body. It's not only having children. Being fruitful is using, placing your potential to use and being of value to the society where you live. That is fruitfulness. Having children is yes, number one. But there's more than having children. One woman who can prove to us that because you don't have to have a man in your life, or you don't have to be a wife to be in the plan and the purpose of God is in Luke chapter one. We know the story. That's the story of Mary. Mary was just sitting one day, her life changed when an angel appeared and told her that God was through having to bring the Messiah. When the angel finished telling her all that, it 
be really a bit confused because imagine a woman who was betrothed, engaged to be married. Maybe she was at the level where she was planning her shabby and everything. And behold, an angel comes and disrupts her life, telling her that she's going to carry a baby. And meanwhile, she was a virgin. In this case, you see that she was not even married. The, the story happened, did Jesus come through her? Yes, Jesus came through her. But you know what? The husband became the one who supported her. So in this story, you see that Mary was the carrier of the destiny or the purpose of God, and Joseph was the supporter. So you see, it's not in every case that it is the man who is supposed to be out there and the woman is supporting. Sometimes, the roles are swapped. Think of a woman like Joyce Meyer, if she comes in here, I'm sure everybody will just start jumping up and down. But who knows her husband? Maybe some of us who have seen his picture. He is more of a supporter. She is the one who is in the forefront, doing the purpose of God for her life. But do you know, in, in, for us human beings, we can, we can say that she is successful and the husband is not. But that is not before God. Because before God, whether you are the one at the forefront or you are the one at the back supporting, none is greater than the other. So when God places you as a woman, be, go, be, go, be, that, be okay with where you are because where you are is more less than where the man is. That's why we begin to have people who come up and say feminine, whatever, agenda, equality, we are trying to fight for uh, women rights and all that. We, we understand our place and we understand that there is no need for power tussle. You see, all this gender equality, there won't be need for it. Because we understand our place. And we understand the role we play. And that the role, everybody's role is different. It's not the same, but it's unique. I want everyone here to join me and let us say this. I am a woman. I, am a woman. I can hear you. I am a woman. I, am a woman. I, am a woman. I have a role to play. I and I play this role in a way that is different. In a way that is different. In a way that is unique. And I operate in a way that flourishes me and nourishes others. What I mean by others, I'm talking about your husband, your children, everybody around you. There's no power to us, there's no need. That is why people, women ask and say, Should I submit? And they are he's not so she's not submissive. She's not so, see, all those things happen because there's fear and there's insecurity. When a woman is sure that the husband loves her, submission is not an issue. That's right. When a woman is confident that this man has got my interest at heart, she will not struggle to say, why should I submit? So that you make me your rock and your in my in-laws, your family will come and step on me, Abby. It's because there's no trust. But when we build trust in our relationships, when the woman sees the husband and says, yes, this man loves me, there will be no cause to worry. Should I submit? A man will not come to the house and say, see you, I'm the, I'm the head. I'm the head. See, an, an organ does not come and start telling the subordinate I'm the head. When he does that, you know that there's something wrong, isn't it? Yes. Everybody knows their place. And we all fit into our rooms. Everybody's okay. God is glorified. Hallelujah. Amen. Our femininity as women is first seen in our body. It's first seen in our look. Just like, can you please put that look up again? When you see that image, there's no question about whether she's a man or a woman. Our femininity, being first, the focus being our body, sometimes we have a problem with it. We're asking ourselves, hmm, do I really want to show? Do I really, I'm a child of God now, should I? See, I don't know if you understand that when it comes to God, everything about him is beautiful. I don't think there's a mystique when God made us the way we are, with the curves, with, with the tender skin, with the beautiful looks, with the long hair. I don't think it's a mystique. It's just because we don't understand the purpose. That is why sometimes we have issues with When you talk about your looks, we come to church and some women say, well, why should I make up? You want to look more spiritual than others? Well, it's okay. But you know, the Bible says in the book of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, maybe we should just look at that. 1 Peter chapter 3. 
I think the script says, it says, um, who's that done? Let it not be that, that, that outward donning of plating the hair and wearing of gold or putting out on the apparel. Let it be the hidden man of the heart. In which is not that which is not corrupted, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Hallelujah. See, there's no being meek and being of quiet spirit does not have anything to do with looking shabby. It doesn't have anything to do with looking, I don't want to wear um, accessories, I don't want to wear makeup. Do you know what? That means you can't even come to heaven. Because when the Bible describes heaven, it says that heaven is paved with gold. And the gold is of such a quality that you can see through it. So if on earth you, you hate this our gold, that to me is not even pure. That means you can't even step into heaven. Remember when God gave um, instructions about how the priest who came before him went to look. God gave detailed instructions even to the color of the precious stones. So how can you not say that this same God doesn't want you to look good? I don't think so. It's because we allow some things to just overshadow us. What do I mean by that? Over spirituality, which is really not necessary. Sometimes it's just laziness. Because you don't want to just take that time and just maybe go and do your hair. Or just look good. It takes effort to look good. Sometimes a little bit of pain. And we don't want that. Sometimes we're trying to hide our vulnerability. As women, it's easy to take advantage of us. Maybe you have loved and someone hurt you. So the best way to hide is to just look unattractive and say, I don't want to fall in love again. I don't want tissue. Meanwhile, you're praying and asking God, why don't I have a husband? Don't say that you're hiding behind your heart and your pain. And you're telling other people, please don't wear makeup. You have an issue to deal with. Deal with it, deal with it first. There's no need to hide. When we say we don't care about our parents, we are making that aspect of the power of God like we don't want to accept it, we don't want to take it. And that's the free gift of God to us. It's just like when you enter a supermarket and you're trying to buy, let's say you're trying to buy conflicts, and on that row where you have conflicts, let's assume that all the ones you know are not there. There's no Kellogg, there's no Nasco, there's no Blue or whatever. All the ones you know are not there. You're seeing new brands. And you must go home with a pack of conflicts. What will you do? You stand and look. You're looking at the one that will appeal to you. You're looking for the one you like. And that's what you grab. Who says appearance doesn't matter? You go to an interview. All of you are seated down. Somebody comes and addresses all of you. They're going to be interviewing you in a minute, just you know. Do you know what they are doing? They are looking at everybody, they are sizing up everybody, and they've picked two people to watch out for. Every other person just escorted those two people. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you the truth. When they go in, every other person, they're just asking you questions so you can just hurry up and go. We know the two people we, that look like what we want. And those are people who took time to take care of their parents. It doesn't matter at this stage whether you have first class or not. When they come in, the question they will ask them is different from the person they ask others. All they're trying to do is to confirm that they're truly what they want. Every other person dismiss. Somebody else will leave. I have a first class, I don't have a job. It's the devil from my village, my dear. It could just be your parents. And the person who has a third class and package herself better gets the job. Do you know what the company will do? They'll train her. Yes, she has a third class, but they train her. That is what your appearance can do to you. Somebody here may say, I'm not looking for a job, but you know what? We're all selling something. Yeah. Mm. Even if it's your shop, you open a shop and sit down. Do you know your parents can make somebody come to your shop for yes. If I see how you are, I can, I can just jump and pass and go to the next shop because I don't like the way you are. You even your face looks so uninviting. Why should I come to you? We can only come to you if there's no other shop that is open. And don't think that is breaking because when the other shop opens, we will not come to you. Mm -hmm. Right on. You may say, I may stay at home, I don't even have a shop. No problem. One day you will need to step out of that house. You will need to. And the way you appear is the way they say that's how you're going to be addressed, right? Those open where you look good. People accept you when you look good. You look more friendly. You look competent. 
when they just appear, they don't know, you don't have any degree or we're just looking and say, oh, thank you, Ma, thank you for coming. But they don't know you don't have anything. It's your parents that are talking. That's right. See, the world has moved on. We're no more at the level where we say it doesn't matter, I'm spiritual, I've, I've spoken with tongues this morning. Yes, those things are basic for a child of God, but you need another topic, the icing on the cake, Top that ups. is your parents. Top I was in the bank sometime ago, you know one of these banks where all the front tellers wear uniform. I don't want to call the name of the bank. And while I was standing on the queue, unfortunately that's the way I do, I can't help it. And I'm sure other people did the same thing, because all of us became judges in our minds. We're just looking at the three of the three tellers, women, and I was just sizing them up based on their parents. One looked neat, okay, outreach, nothing special. Another one looked like she took time to dress up. She looked like she prepared to come to work. Her suit, everything was in place. Her hair, her makeup. Another one looked like they just pursued her. Okay, enter, enter, enter. And she just came there. Okay, I'm supposed to walk. Where is the, where am I? You know, her, her color was flying in the other direction. Her hair was, I'm not just trying to exaggerate. Her hair was just flying anyhow, no makeup. Nothing. Immediately I said, I'm sure she's a mother. It is mothers who make excuses. I'm a mother, I don't have time. And while I stood up, if you're just saying, please, 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 let it be the one that is not in dress or attend to me. Let it be the one that is not. I just didn't want any of those other ones. I don't need that witch. And I know nothing. I don't need the one that just doesn't know how to get herself okay. As far as I'm concerned, if you are going to display the best cashier of the year, it will be the one that is well dressed. I don't know if she's the best, I don't need to know, but that 30 minutes I've stood there, to me she was the best. Maybe she's not the best, but you see, nobody has the time for you to prove yourself. If you need to prove yourself, prove it, so we can see it in one second. And truly, the one that was best dressed attended to me. Maybe it was my prayer that was asked, and I don't know when I was happy. I couldn't have imagined standing in front of the other one. I wouldn't have been happy. Okay? You may say, well, what difference did they make? It may not have made any difference because I didn't have anything to offer them. But what if I was a mystery shopper? What if I was the MD posing as a client? What if I had an offer to whoever was the best I'm going to poach? She would just get the job without making any effort. Do you know why? She has made good looks her lifestyle. And when opportunity comes, she will easily take it. While the other one is still struggling to meet up. So if you see, appearance doesn't matter. I you should think again. It doesn't mean you should spend everything you have on looking good. It only means the one you have, then how to match it well. Then how to use the little you have. Make it clean, make it tidy. Just look like you made an effort. That's all I'm saying. And you see how things will change. You see how your life will change. The other day, a friend came to my house and she was looking really beautiful. I've not seen her like that in a very long time. And as she came in, I said, wow, you look so good. She said, that is what everybody has told me since I stepped out of my house. She said, that for me to have said it, that means this friend said, should I stop you? Although one of us are now photographers, I brought out my phone and I gave her some shots. And she even said people who didn't know her even gave her compliments. It was that serious. So when I snapped her, I showed her the pictures. Do you know what? She just moved away. She didn't want to see herself. And do you know what? I would still live because I've been there. Some of us, we don't believe we are beautiful. We don't think we are beautiful. We don't feel it. So the question is, why should I make up? Somebody has actually used her mouth to say, if I make up, I'll look like a masculine. <laughs> it may sound funny, but she needs to deal with something that makes her think that way. It's not just a statement. It's something that is going on within her. I know because I've been there. You may be looking at the woman standing in front of you, and maybe you will say she's beautiful. Is she? Yes. Well, I haven't always felt this way. I haven't always felt I was beautiful, or I am beautiful. I had issues myself. When I'm, I'm hoping that, well, I'm sharing this story, I'm hoping that a woman here will take something from it. I didn't want to look at the mirror. I didn't want to, I avoided the mirror, I avoided anything that showed me a reflection of myself. Because I didn't feel I was beautiful. And this went on for a while. 
you know. And then my husband bought me my first um, BlackBerry. And well, I got everybody is having a, a picture on DP and everything. And I joined the bank wagon and I put a picture of me on my DP. You know the thing, it's only your two friends that tell you the truth. A friend of mine told me, she sent a message and said, Grace, that's not the you I used to know. I haven't seen her in a long time. She said, that's not the you I used to know. You moved that picture. It just looked like somebody just pinched me and brought me back to life. I looked at the picture again and truly, it didn't look like me. It looked like somebody I didn't know and I was trying to meet. And it was difficult connecting with her. You know, sometimes the things we go through as women, it shows. Beyond the makeup, beyond everything, other things we go through, it shows. You know, when you say a woman is beautiful, it connects the health. Beauty and health is connected, especially for women. We talk about emotional, mental, and physical well-being. One cannot make up for the other. So what did I do? I had to just accept the truth. Not to quarrel, not to argue. It was just the truth. I accepted it and I had to do a bit of rediscovery of myself. I went on a journey. And I did a whole lot of things, starting from the inside. And then I walked out to the outside. And that's what I help women do those days. Because I run workshops where I help women discover, like take their lives back. After maybe being a mother and you are so overwhelmed with everything you've forgotten yourself. Sometimes we all need to take our lives back. So what I did was, at the end of the thing, I now, um, one day came out, I took time to do makeup. I changed my hair, I did my lashes, I did everything, and I walked to a photo studio and told the guy, please, I need a photo shoot. At the time I finished, and I came back to follow him to get my pictures. The guy was just busy telling, talking about pride, arguing over things. I didn't care. What I saw was a woman who was so beautiful, so strong. She looked like she could do anything. I was just gazing at the woman who happens to be me. And I said, is this me? Is this how I look? How come I didn't know? I went back home, and of course, I made the pictures, my DP, I made it everything. But you know something else? I needed to, to see that picture every day because I needed to build my confidence. I needed to build my self-esteem. Your looks help you do that. For some people, you may have to put the picture, take it on as an assignment to do it. Especially if you're at the level where your self-esteem and self-confidence is low. Some you can put the picture at your mirror or wherever. But for me, I needed to put it where I can see it every day. Why did I need to do that? Sometimes as women, you're looking beautiful today. You will not look like this when you wake up in the morning tomorrow. Because by the time you wash off your makeup, the real you shows through, and you're looking at the mirror and saying, wow, is this how I do? <laughs> Sometimes you fade up and you're looking good, but you step out of the house, you forget. Even the Bible says so. You can't remember how you look. You start looking less than you felt when you stood in front of the mirror. But you know what? I needed to see that picture every day so I can remind myself of how beautiful I am. I made it my wallpaper. It was my wallpaper on my laptop. It was my wallpaper on my phone. That means if I picked my phone 100 times a day, I saw that picture 100 times a day. What it did to me, I cannot describe it. That today my confidence is over the roof that when I step out of my, my house, I don't need anybody to tell me you look beautiful. Do you know what? I know. I know I don't need anybody to tell me. I don't need anyone to validate me. I don't need the society to tell me I am because I know. Every woman should get to the level where she knows she is beautiful. Within and without. Because if you don't, and you're waiting for somebody to tell you you're beautiful, the day they don't tell you, you'll be frustrated. You'll be sad. Your day is ruined. Why let your happiness be dependent on somebody else? Why don't you make yourself your source of happiness, your source of strength, your source of encouragement? That is what the scriptures did to me. Right now, whether I say it or not, fine. I've, I've healed to that level where I don't need to say it, but I'm okay where I don't need somebody else to tell me. Because I so know that nothing is going to make me not to know. Hallelujah. Amen. That is just one power of your attribute as a woman. Your looks. 
your looks, your appearance. Your good form comes back to me, you look. Sometimes, yes, you're tired, you're worn out, you look anyhow. But you know what? That's a picture he sees every day. Why don't you try and change it? Make an effort. When he comes back, look as if you're dressing up again. Because that's the image he sees. So that when he goes out, he knows he's comparing you favorably with other people. He's not saying, mm, does my wife if Okashifu compete like this? It's because he has not seen you looking good. Because maybe you work or whatever. He doesn't get to see you looking good. So maybe you should do it. Make an effort. But the motive should be for yourself and not for anybody. If anybody says you're beautiful, take it as a bonus. So away from the your looks as your power, as the power of femininity. I want us to take a story in the in the Bible. In Judges chapter 4, let us see two women who used all their femininity to make something happen in the whole country of Israel. If you talk with me to the book of um, Judges chapter 4, Judges chapter 4, we all know the story, but I just want us to see how two women were used of God. And they were comfortable in their femininity. And there was no argument about it. Those women, number one was Deborah, and the other one was Jill. We know the story. At that time, the Bible says that the people of God, the Israelites, had sinned against God. And of course, not the way God does. He just put somebody who oppressed them. They were oppressed for 20 years. And the Bible said they cried out and God heard. God sent Deborah. Deborah was the judge. They mentioned her husband, Lampy George, but the Bible did not so much tell us what the man did or did not do. That means the focus was on Deborah. Deborah was the one who was used of God. The husband was supposed to be a support. And Deborah called Barak. Barak was the captain of the army of Israel and told him that God was sending him to go and fight the army of the king of Jabin and bring back their victory and bring back their freedom. The Bible says that Barak was so afraid. Barak said he wasn't going and said, Deborah, if ever I'm going, you're going with me. The Bible says Deborah said, okay, I will go. That is one part of a woman that is encouragement. She didn't have any armor. She didn't have any sword. She didn't have any spear. But what was it that Barak saw in Deborah that made Barak to say, if you're not going with me, I'm not going? That's something. And that is the power she carries. Sparrow took 10,000 men and they marched off, of course, in the company of Deborah. But Deborah told Barak something. She said, this battle is not for your glory. And God is going to use a woman to fight this battle. It may look funny because the other army coming against them were mighty, were more powerful than they could ever be. But the Bible says that when the battle started, the God discomfited the battle and the army of the enemy that not one person remained. And the head or the captain of the army who was Sisera took off on his feet. He ran and ran until he came to a, a place called Kenite where he thought he could be at home. And who did he see? Jill, a woman. What do you think? Jill was there, present. That means women, we need to show up. Whatever God is laying your heart to do, First of all, just be there. You may not understand it fully. You may not know it all. But what is required is just that you just show up. And she did. And the Bible gave the story and said that she told Sister to come. Come in. What was working? Her parents. Her parents. She must have had a comely look. She must have had a smile. She must have had a welcoming personality that made Sister to come to her. Remember, Sister was not just a mean man. He was a captain of an army. That means he was a man of status. So he could not just go to anybody's house. That means women, you need to make yourself look like what somebody should come to. Make yourself look like a place where somebody should come, a person somebody should come to. Look inviting. And that is where your appearance matters. So Cesara came to her house, and the Bible says she made him to be comfortable. Sit. Sister said he was thirsty. Can I have some water to drink? She said, Water? 
I will give you milk. What is that? Hospitality. That's one of your powers as a woman. Hospitality was at play. Cesare was comforting. He drank milk. And the Bible says, he had to sleep. But before he slept, he told her, just please, in case somebody is coming and they look for me, tell them that I'm not here. He didn't know that the woman he was talking to was going to be his killer. Because she didn't look like it. She didn't look like she had the power to kill. She didn't look like she could handle a sword. That is the way God made us. We don't look it. We don't look like we can hurt anything. We, can, we don't look like we can kill. But it looks is the power to. But the question is, are you using it for God? Tisera slept. The Bible says that Jill used the covering to God. Imagine someone you're going to kill, you're still covering him. It will make him so comfortable that he wouldn't even wake up. That is care. All of us have the ability to care. All of us can make somebody feel comfortable. That is the power of a woman. And what did she do? She looked for a weapon to use. What could be her weapon? The Bible says she grabbed a tenth nail and she grabbed a hammer. Some people will say, ah, is she a tent maker? I don't think so. The Bible mentioned the tent maker and called his name Paul. That means tent making was a job for men. But this woman stepped into the role that day, picked up a tent nail. Some people will say, well, I don't know where tent nail is in my house. I don't know if my husband that handles it. I am not aware. That is what we women do most of the time. I don't know. I'm not aware. My husband is not around, though. She could have missed it. That means as a woman, you need to be aware. You need to know. You need to be knowledgeable. You need to know what's happening in the news. You need to be armed with information. That's the kind of people God uses, people who are knowledgeable. After the Bible says, study to prove yourself workman, right? That means if all you sit and do every day is just on the internet, is just to send broadcast messages, you're just wasting your time. Why don't you use that same internet to acquire knowledge, to acquire skill, so that when the day God needs you comes, you are equipped, you are ready. You won't start saying, how do I, is it upside down or this other way? Because you know what to do. She got the nail and she got the hammer ready to strike. And she knows that she cannot afford to make a mistake. If you make the wrong strike, it's not strong enough, and Cicera wakes up, she's dead. When the time comes, there's no should I or should I not about it. When God has placed you where he needs you to function, and the time comes, make a blow that even the enemy will not even mistake at all. Blow it like this one blow has to drive in the middle. And that's exactly what she did. You might say, I cannot kill, though. Well, sometimes what we speak, the world has killed many people and they've come back to life. So in this case, there's no I cannot kill or I can kill. What the Lord will ask you to do may not require to kill anybody. But sometimes what God will ask you to do will require you doing something you've never done before. It will require you stepping out of your comfort zone. It will require you picking up a new skill. It will require you picking up a courage. You don't even know where it came from. Who told you she had done that before? The Bible could have said so. She drove in the nail hard. The Bible says it pierced through the ear and came out and pierced him to the ground. That was how hard her blow was. Like the blow of a man. And this is was dead. What did she do? Jubilate? Not really. She recognized that that was for the captain of the army of Israel to have done. But God used her. The Bible says she found Barak and said, Barak, come. I will show you the man that you came from. See, she gave back the credit to the man. There was no power to say. She didn't have to say, please, don't tell them I'm the one that killed him. There was no need. And we not reading her story today. She was okay where she was. The enemy came into her tent and she finished it for God. And she was okay. There was no need for competition. She handed the glory back to Barak and said, Barak, he's dead. You killed this man, all of us go, don't kill. Apparently, it was his place to announce it. So, every woman here, all you need to do is recognize what it is God wants you to do. 
and understand what power you need to put in place to accomplish that. And when you are done, give the credit to who it belongs. There's no need for parties. Hallelujah. Amen. And we know of other women who did mighty things with their power, but sometimes it's the negative. We all know the story of Jezebel. I don't know if Jezebel ever went to any battle. I've never read that in the Bible. She didn't even need to go. All she needs is to sit down and issue a statement. What does that happen? That was how powerful Jezebel was. That a woman like Jezebel could make a statement and a prophet of God who had just killed 450 prophets took off. That is how powerful you are. But the question is, are you using it for God? Or for the enemy. If you ask me, of all the power that God has given to women, the one that is the summary or the greatest of all is the power of influence. You can influence. You don't have to be the head. Just know that your place is to influence things. And sometimes you don't get it. Right. Don't have to say more than even you. You just do like your child like this. You don't know what to do. Did you say anything? No. So, that is influence. You just look at your husband in a way, he doesn't know what to do. That's influence. Even the devil recognizes that. You know the devil is wise. That is when he needed Adam. He didn't have to go to Adam. He went to Eve. Because if he got Eve, Adam is... Sarah. I mean, he's gone. Exactly. And that is why people who need to get to men of power, just go to their wives. They are wise. Because the woman has got an influence over that man that you cannot understand. Right. You cannot understand it. And that is what you have. That is what I have. Sit on, sit on, so sit why do we need to be equal women? Why do we need to carry placards on the street that say gender equality? There's no need for that. There's no need. What kind of influence are you having in your home? Imagine you traveled and your children are left alone with your husband. And maybe you call and say, ah, how are you guys? I'm coming back tomorrow. And they say, mommy, you don't have to come back home. We are okay. Mm. So you come back, they're not abusing all of us, abusing daddy, abusing everybody. <laughs> they're not missing. They don't even want you back. Is that how you are? Some of us are like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For another set of women, it is that when you travel like that, they don't even notice you just did. Your place of influence, your power of influence, you've handed it over to your nanny. Your nanny is the one training the children, all in the name of, I'm working. And when you come back to douse your guilt, what you do is to buy them so much that they eat and they will throw it up. All to just make your guilt, just to feel comfortable. Do you know what? Whatever you buy them to bribe them, they will pass it out. If it's clothes, they will wear and they will outgrow it. The only thing children will remember is the value you give them. You give them. Ten years to come, twenty years to come, they remember. Mommy said this. Mommy did this. Mommy told me this. And the children will begin to say, "Somebody else told them. My uncle told me. My auntie told me." Where were the parents? Where were the moms? That means you didn't do your work. You took out the right influence. And another set of women, when you travel, all they're hearing in your home is, "Ah." When is mommy coming back now? Oh, we should do, ah, we should do it. Mommy said we should do it like this. No, mommy said we should do it. No, mommy said. It's all mommy said. Mommy did. Mommy said. That's all we hear. What does it say? You have influence. You have an influence that cannot be raised. So which are you? Where do you belong? A woman that has a positive influence? Or a woman that doesn't have any influence at all? Or a woman that has a negative influence. All of us belong somewhere. But the question is, where do you belong? We hear of a woman who came to the feet of Jesus and the Bible says she wept. She wept and she used her hair to wipe his feet and broke an alabaster box and applied it all over his feet. That was worshiping God with her femininity. She was not ashamed to use her hair. She was not ashamed to use something of beautiful smell. She was not ashamed to use her tears. 
And the men were asking, what is she doing? I mean, what is this? What is this? When we come to God as women, we shouldn't try to be like men. Or we shouldn't try to worship God like men would do. Let us worship God the way we know to. The way that comes naturally to us as women. The way that God would say, this is a woman. And you know what? The greatest power we have is when we put our femininity at the feet of Jesus like that woman did. She submitted all to him. Sometimes we're confused. Where do I start from? How do I get it right? I've made a mistake or I haven't gotten it right by the people who understand. Where do I start from? Mary was there when the angel came to her. She was at that same place where she was asking, How will all this be? How can it be? How can I do it? How can I be the woman God wants me to be? How can I understand the purpose of God for my life? And the, and the Bible says the angel answered and said, the Holy Spirit come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. That is all we need. We don't need to know it all. We don't need to have all the answers. We don't need to know what to do at any point in time. All we need is to surrender, to lean that has given us this power and has given us this, this look or whatever it is he gave us as a gift. And say, God, take it back. And use it to your glory. The Bible says that after the angel said that to Mary, Mary said, Be it unto me according to your word. There's nothing else to say. There's no argument. There's no worry. There's no anxiety. When you give it over to God and say, God, let it be unto me according to your word. If God had said today in his word that you are more powerful than you think, all we can do is to say, God, let it be unto me according to your word. If God has said you have influence more than you know in your household, in your marriage, in your place of assignment, be it your business, be it your workplace, all you need to say, Father, today, I'm giving it back to you and I'm saying, Father, let it be unto me according to your word. I don't know how many women want to join me in that prayer this morning. So we just lift up our hands and say, Father, I thank you for making me a woman. I accept my place as a woman. I accept the beauty and the grace you have placed on me as a woman. I accept that I have more power than I can understand. Today, I surrender to you. Today, I give it all to you. Today, let it be all to me to your word. Father, cause us to prosper in the place you have placed us. Cause us to prosper in the homes where you have placed us. Father, cause us to prosper in the business you have placed in our hands, Lord. Cause us to prosper in the place of work where our name is as employees.